written production of the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our recreation center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the recreation centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching. You're a slave driver. <laughs> <laughs> I, I follow the time. I got you. Uh, this session will be video recorded and open for attendance by any member who would like to stay, but no one will be allowed to comment or ask questions on the subjects. So at this time, uh, General Manager Bill Cook. Madam President, board members, uh, today I'm here to uh, give you some progress on the security initiative uh, recommendation that was given by the Long Range Planning Committee. Okay. So just to give you a little history, just to make sure we get everybody up to speed on what happened. So in October 12th of 2020, the Long Range Planning Committee uh, presented their recommendation on, on the security initiative for all of the rec centers. Um, that included access control, intrusion prevention, um, and video both interior and exterior, and that was across all facilities associated with the rec centers. Um, the management takeaway from that, or our, our objective, was to develop the infrastructure okay, based on those requirements, and then to build an RFP um, that we could go out and send to um, various vendors to install. And then our also our objective was is to get a rough order of magnitude pricing um, for that uh, for that design. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the March 25th, 21 budget, or I'm sorry, board meeting, we were given the go ahead to uh, contract with FSEC to to do just that, which is to go out and design a system for us. So progress. Uh, step one, contract with the security consultant, design the required infrastructure. Uh, we've completed that. Step two is develop an implementation request for, for, for proposal. So to uh, install and integrate. So we have an RFP. It's roughly 95% complete. Um, they just have to um, complete it with some of the items that are specific to the rec centers in Sun City. So there's certain requirements that, are, that, that need to be in, in, in implemented into the RFP. So the next step then is to actually go out and you know, give this RFP and do the RFP process. So we would send that out to installation vendors to procure the equipment, install it, and integrate it. Okay? But at this point, what we need is we need to know what that RFP or what the components of that RFP are going to be. Okay, so we're going to have, you know, we're going to need a requirement from the board to tell us what is it that we're asking for for the vendor to come in and do. Okay, and then step four would be we would select that vendor once we go through that RFP process and we would implement. Okay. So let's go through what FSEC has done for us. Okay, so we hired them based on the approval uh, of the board to go out and do that. And they did an in-person site survey. So I want to say we took at least 90 days, um, if not more, to go to all of our sites. So um, they had a project manager uh, who was here on site going through and working with um, our director of building and infrastructure, Mike Weeprid. Uh, to go ahead and design that system and then to develop um, the CAD drawings for in inside as well as give us overhead views of the outside cameras. And so one of the you know, requirements of developing this RFP was is we wanted to make it very generic. So they do, FSEC did come back and they made the generic specs, but they also uh, put in recommendations of the uh, cameras and equipment that they felt would meet our needs the best. So if you look at um, the 
camera placement or the first graphic, which is this one. I'm sorry, I should have numbered the pages. I realized that this morning. But this is an example of one of uh, FSEC's drawings. So what they did was they did an overhead with camera placement, and this is our Lakeview facility. So it shows the coverage um, where you know, the cameras would be picking up each of the images. So you can see that you know, the blue and the green shows that image. So if you go to the next page, it's the CAD drawing. So these are the interior designs. And so these are sophisticated CAD drawings that shows the camera placement, interior camera placement at Lakeview for both floors. And it also shows where we would have access control. So each of the doors that we have at the Lakeview facility has an access control uh, device associated with it, and it shows also the cameras, and then it shows uh, glass breakage for all of the glass for intrusion. So this design shows where all that placement is. So this would go out into the RFP, and it would say, here's the number of doors we have, here's the glass that we have, and then here's the camera placements that will sufficiently cover each of the buildings. And remember, each of the buildings has you know, a CAD drawing and an overhead view. I'm going to interrupt. Okay. Is there any way that they can have this displayed up on? They, they can. Hey guys, up in the crow's nest, can we do a presentation or have the presentation up on the screens? Yeah. So you need to get? Yeah. So if you could go, uh, go up about five. We're, we're at the CAD drawings. Keep going. One more. Perfect. There we go. Okay, so again, this is the detailed drawings of Lakeview, both first floor and second floor. Okay, if we go to the next slide, please. So here we're seeing what the cost is to completely implement and integrate and supply all of the equipment for the uh, drawings and for the design that was done by FSEC, okay? So video is 445,000, access control 639,000, that includes 153 doors. And an intrusion, which is the glass breakage, is 123,000. So the total estimate uh, to do the integration and deployment of this particular design is $1,208,171. So additional costs, okay, associated with this type of system is $20,000 per year for the annual maintenance. Now, in this 1208000 at 20000 is incorporated in there. So it is, FSEC has assumed that the maintenance would be in that, in that number, okay? Uh, we have monitoring. So anybody who has a uh, security system at their house, you have ADT and all of those uh, companies that monitor. So if an alarm goes off or glass breaks, then we would have monitoring, and that's $100,000 a year roughly, okay? And that would be 24-7 service. So if we decided that we wanted to do, you know, nights and weekends, or if we wanted to do specific times, not in the 24-7 period, um, this would probably come down. Okay. Then we took a look at access cards, right? So if we have uh, access control, then we would have to replace all of our identification badges and those including employees and our members so that they would have access to uh, each of the facilities that have access control. All right, and then there was one other thing that I, I failed to mention on here with respect to additional costs. And so from a, an RCSE perspective, this is a very large system with a lot of cameras. And so we would probably need to have somebody uh, on staff to specifically, um, you know, if, if we have an issue, review any of the 
uh, video recordings or you know, re report that back to MCSO. Um, we, you know, we, we have probably 10% of the cameras associated with what's on here currently in place, you know, 10 to 20%. And that in and of itself takes a, quite a bit of time when we have issues at these locations. So that would be an additional cost. So do we have questions? Yes. Would, would, that, would that be one employee? Would that be multiple employees? That's a very good question. I, uh, this is not my area of expertise. I'm guessing that it would be one to two is what my guess is, but I don't know what that number is. So, until something like a first shift, second shift, and then the nighttime you would just have to wait. Well, we could be as, as easy as somebody coming in every day and, and an incident report gets filled out at Oakmont that we had an intrusion there. We have somebody reports that they found somebody or they found damage at one of our facilities. So that person that would be on staff would then have to go through all of the video and narrow it down to when the incident occurred and then send that to MCSO. Okay. So it would be things like that. But it would also be IT as well. So we have servers associated with this and cameras and such. So there would be somebody in IT I'm, I'm specifically des designated for the security system. Now, now, you say the annual maintenance is in the, is in the 1.2 million? Mm -hmm, yes. Is that for the first year, the fifth year? This, how many typically years? it's a five-year contract when you have maintenance. So there's five years included in this. Okay. Now, yeah, I'm sorry, Jake Connors is, was the project manager for FSEC. Is he here? I saw him. He's right behind oh, you. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry. So let me introduce Jake. He's the one that did all the dirty work to get us to where we are today. So maybe you can answer that yeah, question. Yeah, sure. So, hi, my name is Jake Connors. I'm with Fire Security Electronics and Communications. I'm on their engineering side and I designed the system. Um, so yes, that covers for the first five years of $20,000 per year, so $100,000 total that works back into that 1.2 overall cost. Now, what I do wanna say is, well, Bill just brought up a great point about hiring an employee on staff. So everyone saw that slide before that had the $100,000 for annual monitoring or something. Give or take, right? I'm just making, I made a broad estimate with that depending on how we wanted to set up a monitoring schedule, but that cost would severely come down if that wasn't a 24 seven monitoring and that cost can be split up in between hiring employees. Uh, typically when we have employees on staff who are monitoring a site, uh, usually it's like a, exactly what you said, a staggered, like a first, second, and maybe even a third shift, uh, depending on how we want to do that. Um, in the design that we actually did, we incorporated the same system that is at the grand location. Uh, our integrator arm of our company installed that and got it into place. It's called the Vigilon. That's the name of the product. Uh, it, the reason why we do that and the reason why we sell Vigilon is because it's, it's a superior product to others uh, and really it, it's, it's amazing when it comes to being able to search through data quickly. So what would happen is if, if an employee from RCSC was hired to monitor the system, FSEC would come in and we would train that employee and actually training was included in that $1.2 million cost as well. Okay. Other questions? Okay. I have one. Oh, go ahead. Uh, in your 1.2, we've got three, three uh, stations. Uh, you got intrusion, access control, and video. Yes, sir. Can we pick and choose which ones we want? Yeah, absolutely. So, so that was a cost estimate. So we essentially came in and did the full design, right? And so I laid out every camera on where it needs to go, uh, put in every access control door that we were going to have. And then the intrusion is, is more than just glass break as well. It's like glass break, motion detection, but then also, or motion detection, excuse me, excuse me, there you go. Motion detection, but also uh, uh, alerting authorities if somebody were to kick in the front door, right? So an immediate call would go out to uh, MCSO. Yeah, so. so, but yes, sir, you, you could, depending on how, what the strategy was from Bill and team, yeah. if you wanted to go through and put in all new cameras first, or go in and just put in access control and new cards for everybody. Go so, ahead. So we could just put in video and intrusion, 
and leave access control out. Yes, but then you'd be at the current access control system that you currently have, yeah. which uh, I'm not sure how well it's working. Uh, another portion or point of our design was to make sure that the video and the access were incorporated. So I, I saw earlier, um, and I, I apologize for not being familiar with everyone's names, but someone had said that someone else used their card to get in somewhere. So with having your access control and your video incorporated, I'd be able to pop this up in, in a second on my cell phone and tell you if that is what truly happened or whom you, who used the card, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, and I, I'm assuming this access control is for all, all clubs. We have 130 clubs. So if I go in my, if I hate this rich, who his wife don't like, yeah. <laughs> she, he said that, I did. Um, <laughs> and let him in, the access control, him being counted is not there then, because it's just me going in with my car. So right? yeah, but that's called tailgating. And yeah, so when- you can tailgate the hell out of me, right? Yeah, 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 okay. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with our system though, um, so in the security world, nobody likes tailgating, right? It's yeah. kind of like a hot button, because it starts with that, but then it ends up with someone letting, you know, their nephew in who's not a good yeah. character, right? So with tailgating, if we incorporate Incorporate our access control in our video, whoever is the monitor of the system, whether that be third party or internal, would get an alert, a push notification, tailgating event has occurred. Okay. And then the camera would pop up and it would show you letting him in and then you'd be in trouble. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying that, yes. that that's, that's possible. Absolutely, in, in yes your, sir. Your, okay. So we would be able to allow clubs to have their open hours where they're going to be able to have guests come in or people to view their things without having this on at that time? Am I understanding that? So we could set that up a couple of different ways, yes. So we could either have a set up like on a schedule. Um, we can set up where only certain people have the card that can open the door. Um, we can set it up where it's locked out or the doors just open until let's say 5 p.m. Okay. And then after 5 p.m., that's when the door contact engages. And then now only Bill's card will work to get into that door or whomever it may be. Okay. So like a maintenance supervisor, that's who you'd set okay. up to get in after hours okay. or the cleaning crew maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because most of our cleaning is done after hours, it's, you know, after 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. So they would, the cleaning crew would, would be provided with their own badge, um, and then that's how they get in. Now, the other nice part about that is then we can monitor the cleaning crew on what time they came in, right, how long they stayed, and did they show up yesterday? You know what I'm saying? Damn. One of the, I, I just would like to say that when the Long Range Planning Committee was talking about safety and security overall, you know, there was a talk about video, very heavy into video, and, yeah. and, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but, you know, our concept was kind of, you know, when you're looking at overall security, it's really like a three-legged stool. Sure. If you only have video, you have one leg on the stool, you get up, it's going to fall over. Yeah. You have to have access and the intrusion, it needs to be comprehensive and they need to work with one another. Absolutely. With that being said, um, we have lots of sites, lots of issues, um, but your program would be scalable. We could start out yeah. picking problematic areas, really focus on, on getting that nailed down and then expand as dollars allowed us to expand outward. Absolutely. First, congratulations on your son getting married last year, by the way. Oh, I yeah. heard that in the beginning. And the reception is this year, by the way. Perfect. perfect. I expect an invite. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yes, so completely scalable, however we want to do that. So if we want to come over and just get the parking lots first, let's say, 100%, we can set that up. Um, we, we can scale this any way that you want. The reason, another reason why we chose the manufacturer that we did is, is because it allows for that. And it also allows for another thing that, uh, so we designed our system to, to be a best-in-class system, right? So mm -hmm. if we're designing it, we might as well design it the best that we can. When contractors are invited to come in for, you know, RFP and everything, they're essentially the way that that works is uh, our company, but the integrator arm of our company, for example, will come in to bid the project, right, against other integrators. So they'll all go in and look at the CAD designs that we put together. They'll end up developing uh, a, their own bill of materials, is what it's called, which has listed of everything and which sites and how much per site, and it'll match up with my numbers, you know, give or take a couple percentage points either way. But what I'm getting at is, then if we come at this and we look at Lakeview, for example, and that's 
$200,000. We can say, okay, we need a breakdown of why that's $200,000. They'll lay it out for us and then we'll say, okay, well, why are you using you know, this high of megapixel camera in this area and then can we scale that down a little bit? This is 100% scalable and choosing the correct integrator to come in and, and bid off of the RFP that we put together is huge because then they can completely scale it back, scale it down, only put two cameras up instead of the eight and then we'll come back to the other six later on. Um, there's a million different ways to skin the cat. We can do this any different way, but yes ma'am, it is scalable. Okay, another question I had or comment I guess is um, when we did, you know, spent the year looking into all of this, a lot of access control can really be managed effectively by um, architecture. Sure. You know, and I look at Mountain View and that it seemed like it caused the sky to fall when we rotated that building. Yeah. But the control access to that rec center improved dramatically. Sure. And, and so, you know, as we're looking, you know, we've got a problem at, at let's say, Lakeview, your, sam your example. Yeah. A lot of blind spots. We've got three entrance exits with no controlled access. Very yeah. problematic. Um, if we would invest in something like this, and Lakeview is going to be torn down at some point and redone, mm -hmm. you know, how much is salvageable? How much can we move around? You know, what's sure. our, our... So uh, cameras can always be taken down and removed. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very simple. It, it's different from the way it used to be, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, now cameras, it's it's just like with a, it's called a patch cord. It's like what plugs into your ethernet. That just goes into the back of the camera um, and then it's installed. So those are very easy to take down, you know, four screws in a, in a Cat5 cable and they're down. Uh, with the head end, of, the access control, the, the expensive part of the access control is the head end system. So that's like the server, the brains of the operation, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's can be taken and moved to us, moved with us wherever we go. Uh, and then past that, uh the readers on the walls, some of them we would take, uh, and then others, because they're typically really inexpensive, I mean, access control, the expensive part, like I said, is the head end, and the manual labor if, if doors have to be drilled and things like that, mm -hmm. right? But some of the readers, they're really inexpensive, so they would stay. If for a total cost structure of it, I would say of the actual product, like 80% of it would be able to take be taken with you, depending on when the building was torn down, right? If it was torn down 10, 15 years from now, that every year that goes on that number comes down. Okay, I have another question. Well, oh, please go ahead. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is we've got some areas that are very um, busy, popular, sure. but we don't have good counts of how much they're being used, when they're being used, that sort of thing. Absolutely. When we're talking about cameras, and I don't know what the cost piece on this would be compared to regular cameras, mm -hmm. but having cameras that actually count, you know, the number of people that. Yeah. Go to let's let's say we take tennis for example. Sure. If we wanted to keep well, something that's not monitored necessarily, but you know what I mean that yeah. we wanted to control or at least count what the utilization actually is of that particular area. Absolutely. Is that possible? I know the answer is yes, but what's the cost effectiveness? Is it was. That? It's already in the cost that we that we designed oh, this system. Wonderful. At. Yeah. So uh, we use. Good. That, that's another reason why we went with this particular brand. Uh, so what they're known for is they're known for analytics, um, mm -hmm. and that's a big buzzword in the security world. But it's things like people counting, um, you know, bounding boxes, being able to set up different areas. Now, with that being said, that's another reason why uh, what Bill was saying about hiring somebody to monitor this. Uh, mm -hmm could be huge, right? To have someone on staff who is familiar with the system, how to use it, and then, and then, so now we get this heat map of the tennis court, right? Well, what do we do with it now, you know? So having somebody on staff who can point that out, wow, you know, between two and 4 p.m. on a Saturday in November, this is very busy, right? Maybe we need to staff up or staff down accordingly. Okay, Sheila, go ahead. Hi. From a professional perspective, yes, we have a lot of a lot of things going on in here. Our technology really, you know, we need to improve a lot of aspects of our technology sure. in general. When you look at RCSC and all the different locations from a professional perspective, yeah. scale of one to ten, yeah. ten being really, really good, one being pretty much nothing. Where do you see us today as far as how would you rate us? 
So I'll say this. So we do a lot of work with uh, school districts as well throughout the state of Arizona, um, and especially our manufacturer, uh, Vigilon, does. Uh, so what I'll say is that you are nowhere near a one. That's good. But we're also nowhere near a 10. I would put us right about in the middle of like a five, okay. right? Um, I've walked into school districts before who didn't have a single camera up, you know, and that's wild. So there are things in place currently, which is good because it shows that an effort has been made, right? And that, you know, they're, someone is viewing these eventually and things along those lines. But we can get you to a 10 very easily. Um, and. And we can get it where you'll have all this data that's easy to make decisions off of that you've never had before. Mm -hmm. So that'll lead to, I mean, if, if we jumped into like a, an ROI or something like that, it would, it would be wild with how much, how many different things we can do with this. Thank you. Absolutely. Bill, this would be under capital or under PIF? So this would all come out of operations and it would be capitalized for anything that's over our capital requirement. And another thing, if I could add, uh, these guys did a good job of actually, there's a, f a slide that they did that actually shows by location what the total cost is. So it was actually a, you know, and that's what we had asked for. We had said, we want to really be able to piecemeal this. So um, they fulfilled that, so. Okay. Dale? Yeah, um, just in preparation for this meeting today, you know, I looked at the risk management report that we get from Stephanie. Mm -hmm. And I kind of did the year to date, which is what I passed out to you guys. Right. So, you know, when I'm looking at safety and security, really there's, you know, the RCSE property damage, there's trespassing with MC MCSO, and then criminal activity also through the Sheriff's Department. And I kind of broke it out. And then the, I took each one of those, um, property damage, trespassing, and criminal activity, and I broke it out by actual sites. So when we're looking at information of like where we need to focus. I was, I was very surprised with the amount of criminal activity that we have um, and, uh, and where a lot of that is occurring, which I don't know if it's a fluke. I only looked at from January through current, what we have, it, what's, what's in our risk management report. So I didn't have a big chunk of time and I didn't really have the time to go back and look five years, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, so I, I know uh, it's helpful to know kind of we've got, you know, and I guess what's surprising to me is a lot of the golf, there's a lot of issues with golf, and I, I was shocked by that. So Secretary Lair, so yes, so I know our, our director of finance, Kevin McCurdy, is really trying to track this a little better from an insurance perspective, not a little better, but to be able to mm -hmm. dice the data differently. So from an insurance perspective, we can also review that. So I know we have lots of information on that, but yes, golf, definitely it's wide open space and there's really no protection in terms of people going out and driving their cars or doing whatever they want to do out there. So, but this plan does include and it, it does incorporate the maintenance areas as well. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. You know, and just for people who don't have my little report, year to date, we've had nine, 109 total incidents regarding criminal activity, um, trespassing, and property damage, mm -hmm. which seems a lot. I know in the four years that I've been on the board, we've had people tearing up golf courses, we've had people getting into the lake and drowning, we've mm -hmm. had uh, our transient population getting into Oakmont. We've had Lakeview problems. We've had golf carts stolen. I mean, security is an issue. We, we do have to do something. So I, I would agree that we've got to address this. This is a huge need for our members and our properties. Any other comments? Okay. Okay. Jake, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and all the effort. So. Absolutely. You're, you're good to go. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> so, Teresa, do we have Vince from Flock on the Zoom call? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, please. So this next solution kind of came out of nowhere. It wasn't something that was solicited. Uh, 
we just happened to uh, get some type of marketing materials from this, and it was, actually went through Stephanie Haholi, and she brought it to my attention and said, do you want to meet with these guys? I said, perfect. You know, we're, we're looking at security uh, solutions, and this seemed like something that was viable. So what I'm referring to is Flock Security. So they are a public safety operating system with the intent to eliminate crime. They provide solar cameras and automatic license plate readers. So that's the technology that they use in their cameras. And a fact that is kind of alarming, but 70% of all crimes are committed with a vehicle. And these cameras also have a direct link into Maricopa County, so uh, into the sheriff's office. So, uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit. So what they have is they would install and, and maintain uh, strategically placed cameras throughout um, all of our facilities. So after doing some research, I found out that Mayor LaVault in Youngtown was also using this solution. So I actually went over and met with him as well. Um, I, I will be honest, I was very skeptical of something uh, similar to this type of option. And Mayor LaVault really was uh, extremely pleased with what results they were seeing in Youngtown with implementation of these cameras. So that's kind of what brought me to say, okay, well, let's do the next step and have them come in, have Flock come in and do a complete design of what it would look like in terms of cameras and cost. So they did that. And if you go to the next slide, please. So this is, this is what it will look like. All right, so they are on 12 foot poles. And again, it's a solar camera, which is great for Arizona. Um, but they are deployed throughout the country, uh, even in, uh, they basically started in Georgia and uh, are very heavily deployed there. Um, so you can see the sign, the big red sign, which I think is probably, you know, the biggest uh, benefit of this is there's a deterrent. It's somebody comes in and they're looking to do some damage or do some theft. Um, this is what the sign looks like. Hey, you know, smile, you're on candid camera, right? Next slide, please. So this is what their design would look like. So if we look at Oakmont, so this is an overview of Oakmont. And then Oakmont, if you look over at the uh, key over to the left, it would require four cameras to cover that facility. And so what the cameras do is they really monitor ingress and egress. And then what they will do is they will actually read the license plate and if the license plate happens to be on the MCSO, um, on their hit list in terms of this is a stolen vehicle or this is a vehicle that we know has been involved in other types of uh, you know, theft or burglary, then it would directly ping MCSO to say, oh, this vehicle was uh, seen or is, it is at you know, this particular camera at this particular time. Next slide, please. So after doing their due diligence, uh, the design for us would require 40 cameras. And again, this would cover all of our facilities. The installation cost is $250, so that's a one-time fee we would have to pay. Uh, and then we would have an annual maintenance contract of $2,500 per camera. So year one would roughly be $110,000, and then years two and on would be $100,000 a year for maintenance. So what questions do we have? And I know we have uh, Vince, who is from Flock. He's actually in Georgia, um, but he is on a, uh, on a Zoom link right now. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free. Bill, Director Reagan, yes. Is the, uh does the $250 include the cost of the poll? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Thank Other you. Other questions? Yeah. Sheila? The cameras, are they owned by Flock or are they owned by RCSC? They are owned by Flock. So we will pay a maintenance fee, and then if we said we don't want these cameras or they're not 
you know, benefiting us as we thought we would, uh, we would call them up and then they would take those cameras. Okay, one more thing. Sure. Um, I'm sure they're probably used to this, but uh, people that take their plates off, people that cover their plates when they know they're up to no good, how does that trigger Flock or does it? So Flock actually has many trigger points. It's not just the license plate reader. It also, if there's a roof rack, it will notify you of that. It will give you the make, color, model of the vehicle. And even if it goes down to the level of if, if there were bumper stickers, it would identify that this vehicle has you know, X number of bumper stickers. So it's more than just the license plate read. Thank yes. you. Dale. You know, in preparing for this, um, and even before this came about um, with long range planning, I think the flock system is great. You know, but it is really designed as a more community-based um, application. And I think uh, it, it kind of takes us back to the whole reason the Long Range Planning Committee got together in the first place. It's because we talked about there were problems in the parking lots and we talked about, you know, getting some cameras in the parking lots. And Flock is on that, I'm gonna go back to that three-legged stool again, it's only video. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the big sale points for Flock um, is that they say that they can, uh, they have a higher conviction rate um, because of the license plate readers. But in looking at the problems that we have in Sun City, um, you know, the transient population, I'm surprised with the trespassing being as lo low as it is because I've been in at, at um, Lakeview and I've seen homeless people come in and use the bathrooms and the showers and stuff. And you know, that's not necessarily reported, doesn't necessarily generate an incident report unless somebody, you know, facility attendant would, would spot that. So if you have people climbing over the wall at Oakmont, the fence, I mean, it's those kinds of things that are that we're really dealing with here, and I don't know that Flock. As long as people understand, this is just one of the legs of the stool. It's not going to stand by itself. Um, so I'm just to be and, clear. And, oh, I'm just sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I, and just to finish up because yeah. um, having gone through the presentations from both uh, people. The Long Range Planning Committee stayed afterwards and we talked about it and it was unanimous that the Long Range Planning Committee really felt that the, the first presentation was the one that would be best, a, a, the better fit. I know it's more expensive, but it would be the better fit for RCSC. Okay. So, so just, just that being said, that's from the Long Range Planning Committee. So I'm not selling any system today. Right. I'm, not, I'm not the sales guy. I'm looking for feedback. I will say that after we uh, opened up uh, Grand Avenue Building 1, we have the uh, Vigilon cameras there. I don't know, I, I think it was week two, I was looking at a video where a guy came up on his bike, kicked over a sign, looked right at the camera, and I know that Stephanie had sent it to MCSO, and I don't believe there was anything that could be done. So I'm not sure if our cameras, even if we had cameras, I'm not sure the effectiveness of actually convicting. Now prevention, maybe, if people see cameras, that could happen. So I'm just stating that fact. And you know, there may be a hybrid solution as well associated with this, so. Uh, Vince, are you on? Can you hear me? Oh. Maybe to maybe address Hello? some of those. Uh, I'm being told that someone can, people can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Uh, I don't know why. So we can hear you oh, well, if he can't hear us. <laughs> He's muted. Unmute. Unmute. Can you hear me? Let me, oh, you know what? Yeah. I, I'm, I have him on text, so okay. let me just text him. We can only hear one or the other. It feeds back if we have both. Hey. Sorry about that, gang. Okay, if you can hear me, then that's good. I just can't hear you, um, which I have no idea why, but we're rolling with it. 
are there any questions? Yeah, so he didn't hear any of that, so. Yeah. Kenny. I, 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 think, I think we've probably, or I've addressed the questions that you've had. Right. So if there's any, is there anything specific that you'd like to ask? And I can text it to him and then he can answer it. I, actually, I can actually hear you guys now. So oh, you can. I think oh, we're he good. Can hear us now. now he can hear us. Oh, there can we hear go. Us? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we can see him. Whatever you guys did, you just switched the screens, and now I can see two of me. Uh, which is great. Uh, uh, who doesn't need two of me? Uh, and then, uh, and I can obviously hear you as well. But yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I think Bill did a really great job of really outlining exactly what we're focused on, and I think the point that he made at the end was uh, was one that I think really is is the most powerful in all of this. Is that we built a license plate reading camera because we know that it is the number one piece of evidence that police need in order to solve crime. Uh, and so the, the grainy doorbell images and the, the traditional surveillance cameras, well, just, just aren't giving police that. And so um, I, I agree that this, this typically is only uh, one piece of the puzzle, but it's the strongest piece of the puzzle. So hopefully that gets taken into consideration as well as you look to evaluate the other vendors. So, so yes, yes. Any, any questions? Yeah. So the general consensus is, is that flock is one leg of the three-legged stool. And when you look at video and intrusion and access control, flock represents the video piece. And so it's very one-dimensional. So with the customers that you have in place, can you discuss the hybrid solutions that some of your customers and how they integrate other solutions with yours? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it, the best, easiest way is the license plate reader from Flock Safety and then a traditional surveillance camera at areas where there's heavy foot traffic, right? So uh, you're, you're not going to traditionally place a traditional like, security ongoing video type camera that's to capture people at the front entrance, right? You're going to want to capture places where there's, there's car traffic, uh, where there's, there's traffic in general. Um, so that's the most common one that we see, which is the traditional and the LPR. Um, but we also see uh, that paired with a patrol, uh, whether that be their own private security company that they've hired or a, um, you know, the local police department um, putting in some extra hours after their shift. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the gating options, but those are traditionally uh, too expensive, and we don't we don't run into them a good deal. Um, so mostly, it's uh, your your ongoing traditional surveillance camera paired with a, a patrol, and and of course our LPR. Perfect. Thanks, Vince. Any sure. any other questions while we got them? Yes. So uh, what you're saying with the flock is that 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 system would stand alone, and it would be um, our job to find uh, other other vendors or whatever to, to, to do the access and intrusion control. But at any time, those two systems don't necessarily communicate with one, one another. Am I correct? No, I mean, there, unless you guys had like a central hub where everything would, could be viewed by a, like a, you know, a, a patrol or a third party. Um, but like our, uh, like our, we do have, companies that have like a gating service and an access control service that like we do partner with. Um, and so you could, you could technically go that route and it would, they would speak to each other, but beyond that, then there's no real, there's no real option for them to actually like, communicate effectively well together. Um, I, I don't, I don't get me wrong. I think like, um, look, there's no silver bullet. Um, there was a product that we know is going to solve every crime that happened trust me, we'd be out of business. Uh, so like there's, there's going to be uh, situations where like, yes, a multi-layered approach is important, but I think there's other, other situations where like, it's absolutely okay to just have one. Um, and at the end of the day, that one should be the one that's gonna provide police with the best evidence possible, which is where we come into play. Does that answer the question? Right now, Flock is in Youngtown and Peoria, is that correct? Vince, did we lose you? Nope. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yay. Uh, correct. Youngtown and Peoria. 
So that leaves us sandwiched in between and basically makes us pigeons for those that want to pick the pockets of Sun City residents, basically. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, um, it's unfortunate, right? But the natural deterrent aspect of a camera is powerful because people generally see one and they, it's just as easy for them to go to the next house or next city or next whatever over uh, in the location that doesn't have cameras. So I think there's some vulnerabilities there for sure uh, in that every other city around you has vlog, but, but you, um, or at least close uh, proximity to you. But yeah, I would agree. Okay. Any other questions, comments? from the board. Vince, thank you very much for your time. Right. It's my pleasure. Thank you all so much for your time. Yep. So, so if we could go to, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I guess, you know, I, I feel like we're a little bit comparing apples to oranges because mm -hmm. we're only looking at video, which, you know, we didn't just get the video out of from the other one. Um, and then, you know, yes, we can go ahead and do the access and intrusion, but if we separate it and we go flock with one and something with another, they are never going to integrate. They will According not to integrate. They are separate. Stand yeah, I, I yeah. Mean, there probably are ways that you can well, do that. Well, and I think when you're looking at the difference, because I look at this and there's a huge cost difference, but we're only looking at one leg of the stool for one, and we're looking at the whole package for the other, so it's really not fair to compare them. Right. So, so if you look at the next slide, I tried to do a pro and con in my head, so I thought, well, here's what I think, just pros and cons, not which direction we should go. So for, for Flock, I mean, it's low cost of entry, uh, direct connect to MCSO, proven to reduce crime, every place that they've you know, been installed, uh, they've been very successful. Uh, they're wireless, solar, simplistic, and it's easy exit if we decide that we want to get out of that market. Uh, and it's fast growth. They're going very fast. I think they're going to try and go public in the next two to three years. Oh, I did, uh, next slide, sorry guys. Next slide. Perfect, thank you. So I'm over on the, the, con, or the pros, which is the left side with the green boxes. Uh, the FSEC pros, um, access control protection, intrusion solution, uh, external full coverage, uh, not just focused on vehicles. So it is three legs of the proverbial stool. So if I go to cons, so Flock, um, if they're new to the market, uh, fast growth, so that can mean good things and bad things. It only focuses on vehicle detection, and it's ingre ingress and egress only. Uh, so with the FSEC solution, uh, some of the cons are high cost of entry. C cameras really not proven to prevent crime at RSC or to resolve crime especially. Uh, high recurring cost, uh, infrastructure invasiveness. Uh, it's a difficult exit, so you know, we're, we have the cameras, we own the cameras. And then one I don't have on here is there is potential for increased costs related to headcount. Is that the question that I had asked about the headcount? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying so if we have to monitor all of those cameras and then we also have to, um, all of the cameras and the infrastructure and the servers, that would have to be an IT person. So I'm seeing at least two to three oh, oh, oh. individuals that would have to support that system. Yeah. Okay. Space. So if we go to the next slide. So next steps. All right. So we, we need direction from you. Where do we want to go? Which do we want one, the other, a hybrid of each? Um, do you need time to take it back and, and think about it and discuss? Um, but if, you know, once we have direction, then we can go ahead and finalize the RFP and send it out and then, um, you know, move forward with an implementation. Okay, Dale. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know what? I think if we're going to do this, we should do it right. You know, and just looking at where 
we have problem areas, you know, and it's surprisingly not just the south or just the, you know, it's spread out a little bit, and it's spread out mm -hmm. for different for different reasons, criminal activity versus trespassing versus, you know, maybe we have to scale it like, like we do with uh, Mountain View, we have to do phases. You know, my suggestion would be, I, I personally like the first one only because it's all integrated. We have history with this company. We, we know this company. Um, I really like Flock, but I think it's, it's more of a community kind of thing. I wish the city, I wish there was a flock camera on my street. <laughs> um, but for RCSC, I really personally think the, the first one is the best one. Now where you're gonna put it, that needs, I mean, I just spent an hour or two putting this together and it's like, there's, there's definitely areas that need concern and need something right away. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my two cents. Oh, yes, G. Dale and I, we always get into this. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, of the 109 incidences, most of them were at golf courses, which oh. the cameras would be, there was only 13 of them at the rec centers over the last, you know, nine months. Um, the, only that, the only problem I have with number one is we can go that way in the $1.2 million, but what's the time frame we can put it in? Because I'm on too many committees, I guess, but the budget for 2022 is already being set. So we don't have 1.2 million sitting around somewhere that we can just jump in. I know you, <laughs> okay, we just can't jump into it. Um, uh, and you know, when you, you break it down by households, you're looking at about $30 per household cost for the 1.2, pardon? 45. He says 45, I say 30, you know. So my math is a little different than his, so. I mean, I think maybe I can go both ways with the hybrid system initially. I, I know they don't mix or match very well, but if we have all the problems at the golf courses, maybe we ought to concentrate there or even go to, go to number one and, you know, forget the access and go the other way, you know, so. Dale? Okay. Um. Right. Of course I'm not going to agree with you, Jean. She never does. I never do. That's right. But I'm looking at my, my number one concern is criminal um, activity. And if you look at criminal activity at the b bottom of the page, I, I put the top five. And it's not uh, golf courses. Yeah. It's Sun Bowl, Fairway, Lakeview, Lakeview Lanes, and Oakmont. Those are areas of all the crime and all the things that are happening. This is the top. This is the big one right here. You know, and Sun Bowl 11, Fairway 9, and I personally, you know, and I've said this before, I think a lot of things we could solve at Fairway with some architectural changes with that monitor desk. In this, and yes, it's gonna cost money, but it's gonna cost a heck of a lot less money if we fixed the access piece right from the get-go. Yes, we made, we made a mistake, we're all human, we made a mistake, now we know. We need to, there's things we could do to address this without even having to take the big bite. But pick, do it right, pick the most areas that need concern and put the money to fix those things. And as long as we have a plan, if we know where we're going, you know, that's, that's the big part. I mean, the things, in reviewing these, I see these incident reports every day. The scary things are having people who shouldn't be here in the showers or in our facilities. Mm -hmm. And also the, the large ticket items like catalytic converters and stolen golf carts, that seems to be on an uptick, catalytic converters especially. So I think access control covers the, you know, not having the ability to come in our, inside of our facilities unwanted. And then Flock kind of takes care of some of the others where you have a license plate reader or it may, they may not come here because they have to have a car in order to steal your catalytic converter unless they want to carry it around with them. Um, so I don't, I don't know what the answer is, to be honest. I don't know what the answer is, but I, those are the things that I would like to address. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, really at the end of the day, and Dale's already touched on this, these really are two different 
systems. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're two different purposes, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, money aside, mm -hmm. you, you need both. Right? I mean, it would be nice, right. certainly, mm -hmm. the access control to protect people. I can't imagine walking into a shower and here's a handful of people that don't belong there. I won't put labels on them. But, you know, and then at the same time, as you mentioned, the catalytic converters, I'm out usually somewhere between midnight and three quite often. And it's amazing how many cars are driving around without the headlights on. So I'm usually taking a picture of them the best I can. I got a decent camera, but trying to get some image of, of the vehicle as it's driving around without the headlights on. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I think we need both of these. I'm not saying in which order of priority, but they're they're just two different things. So, Do we know that they won't communicate? For sure. Yeah, I asked that question. Well, he said that there are some that do. Yeah. And that's why I'm asking, do we know that they don't? I, I don't know that they need to communicate, to be exactly. honest. You know, you have one system, here's Flock, and a license plate comes up, it pops. I don't know that it would have to be integrated with anything else. So, uh, but I, I can't answer that. Right? So doesn't the Flock system information automatically go to the MCSO or does it go to us? No, it's only a hit list, which means that if it is a known vehicle that is on the hit list, it will go to MCSO. Otherwise, we get every single license plate that goes in. So we have that database. So if we have a catalytic converter stolen and that license plate is not on the hit list, then we can go back and say, well, what vehicles went into that particular parking lot uh, and, and kind of determine which vehicles we can send to MCSO. It's like, we have three in that hour, so it's one of these three, right? Yeah. Okay. So if we did the access control and intrusion from FSEC, and then you're looking at Flock as the video part, it would also be much cheaper fund-wise from- It would, it would be roughly 700 to $800,000 if you did access control and Flock. Okay. Yeah, okay. Jean. You know, uh, looking at Dale's numbers, she, she's great on numbers. <laughs> she's a statistic. It looks like we have Sun Bowl Fairway and Lakeview and Oakmont are the four major points. If we were going to go to um, the number one issue and we had to prioritize, is it possible we could just do, do those first and then the flock system? We can, we can absolutely do this in stages if we wanted to and hit the high crime rate areas first yeah. and see that. That's that's an option. Well, I'm just looking at cost because, sense. you know, Wednesday we have another meeting that i got to sit in on, on finances. Right. But on cost, it, it, it would seem to me that we, we need to do something. I agree with most of the people anyway. But but we got to look at also the cost of it initially and how we can do it. Right. Prudently and, and yet get some, some benefit out of it. Right. So. Okay. All right. So you're wanting direction from us on what we would like to do or like to see. I guess personally, I'm looking at, I'd like to see a combination of flock with the access control and the intrusion. That's my opinion. Nobody else has well, one. Well, I got an opinion, but I think I've already said it. Well, I, think. Yeah, I would no, go no. with the FS. Yeah, you're upset. Yeah. 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 And I, I understand. Well, and the good thing is oh. you could always do the flock later. Sorry, Mr. Whitford. Yes, Mike. Good morning, board. Um, well, I would say about the video component of the FSEC, it's more than just looking at the parking lots. They've got internal cameras in the building, so I would not abandon uh, the FSEC video component. You could, okay. might you might say, uh, yes, their outdoor cameras aren't going to record license plates, but it's still a good system, and so that, that's just my recommendation. And I, I, I really think after looking at and sitting through the, the um, the lectures with both of these people. The FSEC is really geared to what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, again, Flock is great, but it's more community-based than 
this is. Okay, so could we get the price of what it would cost to have the internal cameras with FSEC and allow Flock to do external parking lots. in the parking lots sure. along with the other? Absolutely. They, they okay. priced it down to the component level. And I would also mirror what Mike said because, you know, safety of our employees is very important. So I the agree. internal cameras are very, something that we would find very valuable to us as well. Well, and I think safety of members, of they course. would, that's uh, of course. obviously, of course. would be a key one too. Yes. I guess that's what I'd like to see. I agree. Get the price of... Okay. A combination there, using those internal cameras, like you said, Mike, and then uh, using flock in the parking lots and seeing where we where we end up with that. So internal. So do we not want access control then? Badge reading that ability. Oh no no. Okay. no we want that. Oh okay. So I just want to make sure well. we're clear. Yes. yes. So access control, and internal cameras, and flock. And the intrusion. intrusion. And intrusion. intrusion. Okay. So internal cameras, intrusion. And just, I'm throwing something out here for yes, the board. Um, do we want to know the whole package, or are we interested in looking at, as Jean said, hey, I'm agreeing with you, Jean. <laughs> um, looking down. at the, looking at our <laughs> high priority areas. What would it take for us to really look at these high priority crime areas and come up with yeah, a, that's what a like. system to? Mike has. Hello. Uh, since FSEX de de devised this whole all meal deal solution to ready to go out to the market, I think we should send it out to the market and get, but in the ground rule, I think it needs to be said that we want to work with the selected vendor and think of it more of as an a la carte t down to the component level. But we need to get that overall big price first to see, okay, because remember the numbers presented today is that's FSEC's opinion of what it's going to exactly. cost. It's not a real estimate. Yeah, that is uh, true. So we should go out and get estimates, and FSEC might not be the, the selected vendor, but once you get that, then you can say, well, let's just start at Lakeview, and let's just not do parking lot cameras. You can you can dive into the solution, but I think you need to get the overall price um, and the and the recognition from the vendor that we're going to select certain things, not necessarily in the entire. Um, scope of work that we've asked them to price. Okay. Okay. So, feeling? Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for bringing us yeah. down to earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that does. Yeah. He's right. Yeah, so that is step four, is taking an mm -hmm. RFP and going out to markets. To. I, I okay. believe there's some, there are some vendors that are interested in this, so it's a, okay. it's, it's very well, it large. Gives negotiating power, which we don't have right now, so knowing what that True. cost is allows us to go out to the market and say, this is what we have, can you do better? And it also allows them to come back in with a reduced price as well. So mm -hmm. it's really how you do it. Mm -hmm. That is true. Yep. Yeah. And just to reference, you know, one of our candidates here, candidate Thummel, actually, I just want to use a phrase that she uses quite often when we talk about technology is, what's the cost to us if we don't do this? Because it's going to continue to be worse and worse over the years. Yes. That We're looking ahead, like the long-term planning does. We look ahead, and how do we protect our resources here? Mm -hmm. We have to plan for that. If we don't start now, next year, the year after, we're still going to be in the same windmill. Mm -hmm. Thank you for all the information. You're welcome. Yeah. So let's go with the RFP. Okay. Yeah, Bill. Yes. If 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 we do go if we do go out for bids, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they come back, can you give us a time frame of when you think we can pay for it? Everybody good. So I believe that we have carry forward that we could utilize okay. for this particular project, you know, in the 750 to one and a half million dollar range. Okay. Okay. So is everyone on the board good with going out with getting the RFPs? Yeah. Getting yes. that out and getting the bids? On, on step on the first, mm -hmm. first proposal? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we'll yes. leave Flack alone for a while. Okay. Is yeah. everyone okay? I could say something be really bad. We can't make a motion. Right. We're just right. sending out. So just to clarify, RFPs. flock is off the table, right? For now, just want to clarify. Right now. Okay. Right now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. 
ready for planning session two. Okay, Thank you. Uh, next presentation, guys. Good job up there, we really appreciate it. And again, Mr. Cook. <laughs> I'm a little dry right now. Okay, number four. It's gonna be a short meeting, she has nothing to prepare. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So this presentation is related to progress with respect to the Arizona Department of Water Resources fifth management plan and where we stand in terms of being able to meet that fifth planet management plan. So the current status, we are under the third management plan, okay, and we've been under that plan for quite some time. Uh, and it was, you know, required Okay, because of the lake seepage, we're at roughly 585 acre feet per year. Um, so what we've done is, is we've contracted uh, two engineering firms, Pace and Terracon. Terracon had actually done this 10 years ago as well. Um, so they were very familiar with our, our location. Uh, and do a repair study, okay. And so, uh, I, you know, as the f former finance person, I was, you know, very scared of what these numbers were actually come in at. And what we found is, is that um, both actually came in and, and recommended a very similar solution. So the solution is basically a, uh, a drain the lake, add a new liner, and then also repair the wall. Not, not repair, replace, I should say. So we'll be replacing um, you know, the wall, which we know there's some disrepair um, at certain locations. And both actually came in right around the five to six million dollar range to do all of it. So we were actually pleasantly surprised. I don't want to spend six million, but we were pleasantly surprised at that. Um, in addition, um, over the last you know, ten, ten years, um, five years, um, we've already you know, implemented some mitigation with respect to um, turf reduction. So we know that we've done turf reduction and uh, we've also, um, you know, implemented new irrigation. So, you know, that irrigation is really helping us to mitigate our water usage. Um, and then it's just, you know, one thing that we want to point out is that, you know, the, the restrictions requiring golf course property, uh, the usage of those, that golf course property is uh, for golf only. Okay, so next page, slide please, thank you. So we have the fourth and fifth management plans that are coming down the pipe. Okay, so the fourth management plan starts 1-1 uh, of 2023, and that's a 6% allocation uh, for, uh, from the third management plan. So currently, I believe we're at 5,089 acre feet per year. Um, and then the fifth management plan actually comes in uh, into play and in effect on 1-1 2025, and that's an additional 7% reduction from the fourth management plan. So we're, we would roughly be in the low 4,000s come 1-1-2025. Um, what we're hoping, and we've been in meetings, many, many meetings with ADWR, uh, we're hoping that the fourth management plan really uh, is, I don't want to say, it, but it's ignored, and the fifth management plan is really what they're headed down because that's the most restrictive and that's what they're trying to do. And it doesn't make sense, I don't think, to have a two-year plan, but. So we are right now trying to meet the fifth management plan. So what that states is, is that we are limited to 90 acres per golf course, okay, for, for 18 hole golf course. So that means we have to remove 220 acres to meet that requirement at, at approximately $36,000 per acre. Uh, and we just, we just can't do that by 2025, okay? In addition, Okay, um, they're also saying that only one acre per hole will be allotted for low water use plants. So for a course like South, where we're removing 109 acres, that means only 18 of those acres really are going to be low water use, or if we already have low water use plants on any of those holes, it's limited to one acre. So clearly that brings up uh, quite a few potential issues with having that much um, 
uh, granite, and, and so we have dust issues, and, and quite honestly, it's an, you know, it's an aesthetic issue as well, so um, there are some potential issues if we're limited there. Next slide, please. So we, here's our plan. So the first piece of this is land management. Okay, so we have to fix Viewpoint Lake. That's 585 acre feet per year. That's at a cost of six million. Uh, turf reduction at 220 acres, seven to 10 million. Um, and then we would replace that with low water use plants and, uh, and granite. Uh, irrigation replacement and green rebuilds, that's roughly seven and a half million. So uh, we have the remaining two courses, uh, Quail and South, from an irrigation perspective. Uh, so the total potential cost right now is twenty-three and a half million dollars. So we also have looked at some other mitigation strategies when it comes to land. Um, we, we looked at native grasses, we actually um, tore up a, an acre at South behind the maintenance facility. And it's a good thing that we did this to try and do this because it really opened up our eyes to the extent that Nuts Edge is really Satan's spawn. Uh, we can't get rid of it. So it's really tough to prepare the land in order to you know, put in native grasses. And we found that out very quickly. So it's probably not feasible. Um, Bermuda grass, we have a Tiff Tough uh, branded grass that will reduce usage by up to 30%. So we are doing some tea boxes right now to see how that works. And then affluent water, which I think affluent water actually is something that maybe five years from now may be a solution as the fifth management plan gives, uh, continues to give the same credits as the third management plan. So it's really in, in our best interest uh, to try and use that so we can get those credits. Um, so I have had discussions, um, you know, Peoria said they can't do it, but El Mirage was very interested. Uh, so that's something that's in their hopper. They are looking at this and they're escalating it, but at this point, you know, it's government, so it's going to take some time, but I think we can get there. Yes. Yeah. Can you define that effluent water? So you get a 70% credit by utilizing effluent water. Now, I will say there are some caveats there because the, the effluent water has to be at a level that we're not going to destroy our grass because you know, there's too many uh, solution, uh, solids in there and I'm sure Brian could talk uh, to it, but uh, that's, those are the discussions that we would have. We would have to have a quality measure with respect to the water that we get so that we know that it's good enough for our grass. Define effluent water. I'm sorry? Define. Define it. Effluent water is water that, for example, El Mirage has their own plant where they take water, water that has been, I, I believe it comes from, you know, the, your drains and such, and then what they do is they make that water and clean it and clarify it to the point where it's, it's usable for land. Okay. So it's reused water. And somebody could help me out if they have any other solution or something else that, yeah, that right. defines it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Wastewater. <laughs> Wastewater. Yeah. It's only been through. It's called purple pipe. You know, so yeah. Yeah. It's re reclaimed water. Right, right. right. Yes. Yep. Reclaimed water. Okay. Reclaimed water. Yeah, okay. that's good. Not, not yep. Right. Okay, got it. Okay, next slide, please. So there's legislative help as well. So we did send a letter to ADWR that was signed by our state center and two of our representatives. So we basically, the letter stated that here's our issue. We are a pre-1985 golf course. We were designed and, and created in the 60s when you know, we weren't worried about water. And so there should be exceptions for those courses. So that was sent. And then there was also a grant that was developed by the uh, Visitors Association. And so these are monies that the, gov that the federal government allotted for states for COVID that was underutilized, and therefore they are reusing these funds for water uh, 
restrictions and, and mitigation. So we actually, some good news, we actually, um, so I put in eight applications and we have a team that, you know, from Brian and, and Jan and Gary Brawley, our architect, our golf course architect, put together a statement to work and it was a detailed process and we actually were granted $525,000. So, I mean, it's, in the scheme of things, it's small, but it's better than nothing, right? Okay, and then, uh, next slide, please. So then there's the regulatory piece of this, okay? So, the fifth management plan, the wording, the regulatory wording was, uh, recently, actually recently, I think within the last 30 days, was sent out for review, and we have the opportunity to actually change the wording on there to, to help with that. So we have hired an attorney, and uh, she's been involved in, in the team that I just mentioned earlier. We all went through the fifth management plan wording and drafted a, a version that would help us. Okay, so what we're saying is, is that we want to maintain the third management plan, okay, from now until through the fifth management plan until we can be fully compliant. So what we're asking is, is that, so on 1125 is when the fifth management plan starts. We're asking that the first golf course, which we think would be south, is complete by 2030. Uh, I'm sorry, it would be 2029. So give us five years from the start of the fifth management plan to allow us to get that first course underway. And at that point, we would, through that, we would still be under the third management plan. And then once we get south in line, then that would become under the fifth management plan. And then for each course after that, we would get one year okay, to come in line with the fifth management plan. So that would rough, roughly get us we're hoping seven to 12 years, okay, to get us to uh, compliance with the fifth management plan. So we've sent that in, I wanna say two weeks ago, we sent that in and then we've requested a meeting with ADWR, which they've been you know, very open in terms of saying, we will meet with you. So what we're hoping is, is that uh, they agree in concept to what we've proposed and that would give us some time to generate the funding needed to uh, come into compliance. Next slide, please. So the next steps. So uh, I know Jan has, has submitted her request. Uh, we've given them some dates that we can meet. And so we would take our team with our uh, water attorney and with uh, Gary Brawley, our, our golf cor course architect, and we would go down there and plead our case. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will be successful. Um, so we need to determine what their likely, you know, position is going to be with respect to what we're asking. And then from there, then once I know that they're gonna give us some time to implement, mm -hmm. then put together the PIF to make sure that we can accommodate, you know, that big 20 to $25 million hit to our PIF. Okay. Questions. The lake, though, we're going to fix that before. Yes. So the I, plan for that is to start that when next year. So that is our that is our current plan, um, and and really that's going to be a bargaining chip for us, because ADWR is going to want to see us being proactive, and so that's what we're gonna tell them is, is that we are being proactive. We can start with six million and get the lake fixed, and then we can go to our golf courses. And you said we would have to drain the lake? We will have to drain, the, the plan right now is it would have to be drained, um, and then they would remove any sediment. And the good news is, is there's not as much sediment as we initially had thought as um, Pace had come in, and they had actually taken, I believe, 90 samples. So they went down, and it's uh, as little as three inches of sediment to, you know, I think they got into the one, to eight, uh, one foot to 18 inch, but, it's certainly less than we thought, which will help us with, you know, any, actually getting all of that and getting us prepared to lay, um, you know, the tarp down underneath. Okay, and fixing the lake would it take approximately how long? What we're hearing is one year. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, one year, right? <clears throat> oh. 
Jean, go ahead. You want to go first? You ladies first. Oh, you had okay. your hand up before. <laughs> um, a few years ago, we looked at this lake. You know, uh, it's, it's not a new thing. We've been leaking for a long time. Right. We were going to, at that time, have to build a coffer dam and use only one and keep one third. Is that still a, a problem where we can drain it completely? We are going to drain it completely. Both of the engineering firms have shied away from coffer dams as they are very, very yeah. expensive. Then what are we doing to water the golf course? So some of our water comes out of that lake. So we have a plan in place. We had uh, some of the engineers come out. Brian, you want to talk to that? I'm sorry, I remember all this from the past. I can't what I had. I don't remember what I had for breakfast, but I remember 10 years ago. President Wilson and Director Westermeyer, uh, the current um, plan is to, if you're familiar with Lakes West, the last lake that's there on hole number three by the tee box would be to run a pipe via a um, gas-powered um, pump uh, overland to the pump station, which is adjacent to Del Webb Boulevard right. by the third green, into a 20,000-gallon holding tank that would be under pressure. Would, As that, soon, be, would that be above ground? Yes. Okay. They, they'd basically bring it in on a semi and roll it off kind of like a um, storage unit looking type apparatus. Uh, once the irrigation system turned on at night and one drop of water was put onto the golf course, the pump that's down by the lake would kick in and start refilling the tank immediately so that it would always be... Is that under. is that cost part of the six million? Yes, okay. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the best solution to avoid the coffer dam. Okay. The, the, the issue with the coffer dam brings up is you're never going to be able to. It would be a weak point in the design. Where yeah, the, because you'd, where we'd, the two we'd have a seam there where the coffer dam was going to be, and they were going to overlap that by six foot. But Correct. Okay. The other thing I got is if we take the $6 million out of the 24 for the lake, we got $18 million to spend on on golf courses, and that's over 10 years, right? Or approximately two, two, two million a year. It's actually would be starting in 2025 is when we would start yeah. our complete land mitigation plan. So uh, from today, it would, we're hoping to get 10 to 15 years yeah. to be able to do all courses. So roughly you're talking $1.82 million a year for the 10 years out. That's... I mean, you'd have to... Because each golf course is going to... I don't have my HPC here, so I... You know. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> each golf course is going right. to cost us roughly in the last estimate we had about $1.2 to $1.8 million a year. Well, so the problem is, is that South is going to be $8 million. So that's going to be a big hit right up front. So you can't really just amortize that over the 15 years. So South will be big. And then after that, you know, it de decreases quite a bit. Right. Dale. Um, just a comment about the land um, management in regards to this mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. I know we're talking right now, it's all focused on water, but if anybody had an opportunity to read the Arizona Republic yesterday, there was an article in there about heat mitigation as well. And I hope that when we are looking at land management that we're not just taking out turf and putting in gravel, but we're really looking at plants, trees specifically to increase Excuse me? Yeah, that's there the are trees that have little or no water usage. And you know what? It's in the long run, you can, you can blindly go ahead and do this, but heat mitigation is the next thing that's going to be barking right up your back. And you can put in mesquite, little or no water usage. You're increasing the shade, which is going to make the golf course much more comfortable to play on, um, and it's not just all rock that reflect back up and I'm just saying. So we would have to utilize ADWR's list of approved low water use plants too yeah. as well, so mm -hmm. we would have to comply with that. I'm sorry, Jen, do you want to say something? Well, there was some problems. Do you remember what Gary said about the mesquite tree? There was a huge problem with that, but I don't know what it So, I, you know, I've had mesquite trees and those things are, to maintain, to maintain those trees, 
it is not fun. Uh, so, and they grow very fast, we agree, mm -hmm. you know, and so shade is a great thing. But then again, you may have homeowners who say, I don't want a big tree out there blocking my view of the golf course. That's what I paid for, right? So, yeah. Brian, you wanna add? President Wilson, directors of the board, the mesquite trees in particular have a very aggressive root structure. If anybody's played south um, along the driving range in various places throughout the course, uh, they're kidney busters if you drive near them. And the biggest issue is since we're taking turf away from the outliers of the golf course, we'd be putting an invasive root system next to um, people's homes, which might eventually interfere with their their walls and that type of thing. So yeah. that's just specifically mesquite trees in general, but and they're messy. Yeah. Okay. 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 Other comments? Okay. Gene, yep. got Bill, are you looking for something from us? No, today this was just an update telling you where we're at, giving you a heads up that there's a $24 million hit to the PIF potential, and so just making sure that you understand what the, you know, what, what, it, what it looks like for us. So Bill, are we sending out RFPs for the lake? What are we doing on that? Yes, that's what we will do. Um, okay. And Mike will, will lead that effort and we will go out and do that and get a final cost. And then, then we'll come back to the board and then we'll vote. So we'll put, a, we'll put a PIF plan together with, that would be a component of that and okay. we would approve the PIF. Okay. Okay, Jan. Madam President, Board of Directors, I just wanted to address a couple things about the lake because we have several lake homeowners that are here and that there will be a meeting forthcoming with uh, Lake uh, um, Viewpoint Lake Management Board and the homeowners as we have done in the past. But just to give you a little information about, um, you know, what we have discussed with the engineers and et cetera is that, um, it, it, Bill has already expressed that the lake would be completely drained. All the walls would be replaced. So I'm sure you're immediately saying what happens to our boats and what happens to our docks and what, ha right? Um, so the um, docks would be removed and replaced and the boats we would, we do not have the answer, but we would look for a place for you to pull them out, store them and then put them back once the lake has been refilled again. And um, the turtles will be um, uh, handled and taken care of. And the swans, we have a name of someone that can uh, remove the swans and bring them back once the lake is done. And the, and the fish habitat are going to have to live somewhere else. No, they're the heart. But we will, or the fish, but then we will put them back in. Now they will be bigger and better. They'll have the best fish condos yeah. ever. Because we don't have to do it with the lake full this time. So that might be, um, and if you have some other questions, we'll be ha happy to hang for a bit afterwards, and then we'll get a meeting with you pretty soon. Okay, all right. Any other discussion from the board? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. I will adjourn this meeting if you guys are okay with that. We're good. Oh, yeah, no, I agree with what you're saying. I just don't know how you go back. production of the Recreation Centers of Sun City Incorporated and is intended for the sole purpose of informing our Recreation Center members. Any duplication, copying, transmission, broadcast or use including electronic and social media is strictly prohibited without the prior written consent from the Recreation Centers of Sun City Incorporated. Thank you for watching.